والصلاه والسلام على سيدنا محمد سيد المرسلين خاتم النبيين وعلى اله واصحابه اجمعين عباد الله اوصيكم واياي بتقوى الله وطاعته واحذركم واياي عن عصيانه تعالى ومخالفة أمره يقول الله تعالى في كتابه العزيز من عمل صالحا فلنفسه ومن أساء فعليها وما ربك بظلم العبيد My dear brothers and sisters let us begin by entering into the space of worship a space of a deeper remembrance of Allah a space in which we empty our hearts and minds from all of the thoughts and emotions that stream through them constantly. And in this state of inner peace, inner tranquility, inner calmness, as well as a physical calmness, we then bear witness that there is no God but Allah alone. Nashadu an la ilaha illallah as we do this my dear brothers and sisters we feel our hearts and our souls prostrating before the presence of Allah acknowledging his overwhelming power and might and glory and light and all of his attributes and how we are totally poor before him as Allah says you are all poor before Allah. Allah is the one who is wealthy or beyond need. Or you are all needy before Allah and Allah is the one who is beyond need. There's one thing to understand the verses of the Quran, but as we were saying last week, brothers and sisters, our special focus is to become like the Prophet and to become increasingly walking Qur'ans like him. We complete this testimony of faith by bearing witness that our beloved Prophet Muhammad وسلم, peace and blessings be upon him, is his beloved servant and messenger. Ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh. Last week, my dear brothers and sisters, we made the point that our objective in following the Prophet's Sunnah is to become as much like him as possible. And the values of our actions, and the values of our acts of worship become more and more like his or less and less distant from the value of his acts of worship. And the appellation that was given to him by his wife Aisha as the walking Quran, we suggested that we too should make it our objective and the objective of our educational programs. What that means, brothers and sisters, that we should read the Quran, listen to the Quran, <clears throat> and internalize as much as we can of its lessons, its commandments, and instructions. We made another point last week of nuancing the difference between doing and being. And the reason why we did that is because you can do something perfectly and yet not be that. In other words, you can perform Islam perfectly. You can perform the five time daily prayers perfectly. You can fast perfectly. You can memorize the Quran and recite it perfectly, etc. And you can still be a rotten and evil human being. This reality is indicated, or this truth, or this possibility is indicated in the Quran by many, in many ways, especially the frequent mentioning of the hypocrites, a trait which the prophet's believers, the prophet's followers rather, were very scared of becoming. And they always tried to measure themselves to make sure if they were sincere in their religiosity or if there was a little element of nifaq of hypocrisy in their actions they were very concerned about falling into this sin of hypocrisy this difference between being and doing is also amplified by several hadiths of the prophet 
I've shared many of these with you before. One of these is the hadith where the prophet says, many a person fasts against nothing from his fast but hunger and thirst. A may a person does qiyam al-layl, meaning additional prayers and tarawih prayers, and gains nothing from his prayer but fatigue. Another hadith which exemplifies this difference between perfectly doing something and not being that is that the Prophet tells us that a time will come when people will recite the Quran but will not descend any further than their throats. A, a poetic way of saying that it will have no impact on their behavior. The problem with these hadiths, brothers and sisters, the problem with, with, with trying to wrap our heads around these hadiths is that many of the comments the Quran the Prophet makes about unbelievers and hypocrites and stuff like that are not we're not completely protected from. I mean, hadiths like this should prompt us to question ourselves whether we are guilty of such criticism. Do you feel the effects of your prayers and of your fastings? Many of us who are intentionally sincere yet do not feel the effects of our prayers or of our fasting. Or when we recite the Quran, that do we always register its meanings and strive to follow it? Or are we giving it lip service? For example, if we recite Surah Nasr, which most of you know, which ends with the verse, فَسَبَّحْ بِحَمْدَ رَبِّكَ وَاسْتَغْفِرْهُ which means, so hymn your Lord with gratitude and seek his forgiveness. Do we respond to this divine command and repeatedly say, Subhanallah wa bihamdi and astaghfirullah, which is what this verse commands us to do. It commands us to sabbih bihamd rabbik wa astaghfirhu, to do tasbih of Allah with gratitude and to say astaghfirullah and to feel a sense of remorse for our shortcomings. Or do we just, are we happy with just reciting it in our prayers and not applying it into our behavior? In other words, in the words of the, in the, words of the Prophet, when we recite these verses, does it go below, below our throat and make an impact on our behavior? That's the question, brothers and sisters. The Prophet himself said in the hadith that he does istighfar 70 times a day. In Arabic, 70 times is a number which is used not only literally, but figuratively as well. It's like when you complain to a child, I've told you a hundred times to neaten up your room. It, it means countless times. It, it could be a hundred, could be more than a hundred, could be less than a hundred, but it means more than I can count or more than I can care to count. So the Prophet, the Prophet himself, who we regard as the perfect man, the perfect soul, the perfect being, admits that he does istighfar at least 70 times a day. Do we do that? Are we, are we really obeying the, this verse, فَسَبَّحْ بِحَمْدَ رَبِّكَ وَاسْتَغْفِرْهُ Or does, does it go beyond our throats? So you see, brothers and sisters, when you when we read these things in the Quran, you know, and maybe in our younger days we said, ha ha ha, look at these unbelievers. But as we mature and get deeper, realize that many of these descriptors or descriptions apply to even those of us who are believers in various degrees. Now it says in the Quran, in Surah Ankabut, the 29th Surah, verse 45, a verse which many, many people recite during the khutbah. In the Surah Tanha al-Fahshai wa al-Munkar wa la dhikrullahi akbar. Indeed, prayer eliminates or brings an end to or reigns in indecent or obscene and atrocious behavior. But certainly the remembrance of Allah is greater. And as the remembrance of Allah, Dhikrullah is greater in its effective force in erasing the indecency and evil behavior. 
Now, internalizing verses like these brothers and sisters means that we have to ask ourselves, are my prayers removing my tendencies to act in a negative way? Are my prayers making me a better person? If, if we don't feel that our prayers eliminate the negative aspects of our behavior and amplify our ethical behavior, then are we really realizing the meaning of this verse? If we don't achieve what the Quran is pointing us towards, then what's the point of our prayer? All we're getting is fatigue, as the Prophet said in the Hadith. These are examples, brothers and sisters, of performing an act of Islam perfectly, but not benefiting from such performance spiritually. This is the difference that I'm referring to between doing and being. And many people think that doing something perfectly means you are being that perfectly. That is a fundamental error in thinking and in conflating. Conflating means to bring together being and doing. Now, zooming back to where we started a couple of weeks ago, when we pointed the Hadith of Jibril, which, which Jibril asked the Prophet of Islam, Iman and Ihsan, that these three ideas are interrelated and interact with each other. Ihsan, which the Prophet described and defined as worshipping Allah as if you see him. This connects us back to the first and primary act of Islam, which is the Shahada, to bear witness to Allah and to his oneness. So what this does is it nudges us, it urges, it pushes us to shift our performance of the Shahada from just being a perfectly recited expression on our tongue to urging us to being in a state where we can actually see and witness Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because one can recite the Shahada perfectly. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. And never have witnessed God. How then, if we want to make the Shahada go beyond our throat, in the words of the Prophet, how do we do this? How do we give real meaning to our Shahada so that we feel that we have actually borne witness to Allah? I have so often shared with you the story of how I learned to perform my prayers when I was about nine years old. And by the time I was around 12 or 13, I think, or maybe even, I don't remember exactly, but somewhere in that range between 10 and, and, and 14, I felt bothered every time I recited the Shahada when I was praying. Every time I said, Ashadu Allah ilaha illallah, I felt a feeling in my, of hypocrisy in my heart. My soul was telling me that you are saying something so magnificent, but you haven't witnessed God. What are you talking about, Faisal? So it bothered me. I felt my prayers were not actually valid. It bothered me so much that I asked my dad about it. The point that I want to mention here is that in, in this case, in my case, in looking at my case backwards from the benefit of years of later experience in spiritual growth, my prayer spurred me to want to experience the, the witnessing God. And I was, the fact that I was able to, to pronounce Ashadu Allah ilaha illallah, but not witness God, that gap, that difference was jarring enough to me that it urged me to want to experience God. Because otherwise, I felt my shahada and my expression of shahada was meaningless. Now, it took me a year or so or more until I had a, with a, with immense gratitude to Allah, till I had a very powerful experience of witnessing God. But for the following 20 years, at least, until I, you know, I hadn't witnessed the prophet. I hadn't born witnessing the prophet. And that also bothered me. I felt that my shahada was half realized and authenticated and half not quite fully realized. And I struggled with that. So what does it mean to, to bear witness it's one to say, I believe, I, 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 in the sense of I suspect, or I agree to the idea, I accept Muhammad as messenger of God. 
but I could not honestly say that I'd reached the point where I bore witness to him as such. My witnessing of the prophet happened when I had a dream of the prophet when I was in my 30s. And only after jo I joined the circle of dhikr, by the way. Which, which brings us back to the power of dhikr in, 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 in really in, in being far more effective in, in, um, in turbocharging our movement along the spiritual path. In other words, the, the verse where Allah says in a Surah Al-Fa'sha, in a bunker, where dhikrullahi akbar, dhikrullahi is more powerful in its impact. It was the power of the dhikr that when I saw the Prophet in the dream, and he was instructing me and answering questions that I had, that was when I felt this gratitude and feeling, ah, now I have finally, actually authenticated and realized the first pillar of Islam. Now I have borne witness to Allah as God and the only God and that Muhammad is indeed his messenger and prophet. So you see brothers and sisters, even though we are believers and we are sincere and we try to improve our spirituality, do not think that the, that the criticism or descriptors that Allah describes, by which Allah describes unbelievers, is something that we are, we are immune from. We are not. And I'll speak more about this. One of the things that our spiritual teachers have told us, maybe I should just now talk a little bit more about the process, the importance of process. Of, of, of witnessing God and the challenge that we have. Because the fact is, brothers and sisters, Allah is not absent from any place or anywhere. There's nowhere in the universe where Allah is absent from. Allah says in the Quran, To Allah belongs the East and the West. So wherever direction you turn, there is the face of Allah. Verse 115 of Surah Al-Baqarah. So what this means, brothers and sisters, and Allah mentioned this point in a slightly different phrasing in a couple of different places in the Quran. If Allah is everywhere, then the issue is not where you can see or bear witness to Allah, but how you can get to see Him and witness Him. So what this teaches us is that since Allah is everywhere, the way we get to witness Allah is via a process. And the primary aspect of this process, according to many, many spiritual teachers, is to get yourself out of the way, is to get your ego out of the way. In fact, the ego is considered by many spiritual teachers as the greatest impediment on the spiritual path and the greatest factor in, in weighing you down, in slowing you down on, in moving on the, on the um, spiritual path. I'd like to conclude by sharing this point and, and to highlight this point and to conclude my, my khutbah today and will continue inshallah in the following weeks by quoting you some lines from a very powerful work, a very short work, only about two, three pages in Arabic, and I you know, maybe a translation, an extra page or so, of Sheikh Wali Raslan from Damascus, Syria, who lived centuries ago. 
he begins his very it's a very powerful piece of prose but there's a lot of poetic you know poetic usage as the arabic does as our great arabic writers do he begins his risala by saying wa'lam annak anna kullaka shirkun khafi wa ma yabinu laka tawhiduka illa idha kharajta mink wa'lam means know that you are entirely shirkun khafi shirkun khafi means a hidden shirk or a subtle shirk and your tawhid your unity with god which is when a state which you witness god will not will not appear to you until you exit from yourself or exit from your ego or detach from your ego i say kharajta mink in arabic literally means until you go out of yourself what this means brothers and sisters when you stand before allah when you really stand it, when your self is in the presence of god the power of god is such that the boundaries of your ego disappear it is much like the saying when the sun rises the stars vanish the stars are still there but the brightness of the sun completely overwhelms the stars where have the stars gone they are still there but in a different form you've heard very often the analogy of when a drop of water you know drops into this ocean it becomes one with the ocean well let we can make another analogy when the sun appears rises the stars are still there but you don't see them anymore they have blended with god so the the, the point of view of witnessing god is where you can feel that the the light of allah the light of allah is so present that you don't that 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 you can't tell the boundary in the difference between yourself and god and that is the state in which your act of witnessing god is at its very purest as a very maximum point as for the process of helping you acquire this our spiritual teachers have taught us that the essence of the spirit of this particular journey of this process comprises two things dhikrullah and right sohba which means remembering allah and right companionship or the proper companion or the appropriate companionship this is based on the historical beginnings of our faith which was based on the Quran as the primary source of dhikr and sohbah companionship of the prophet which happened at the dawn of Islam so from a spiritual perspective a sahabi a companion of rasulullah might you might call it a student or a murid of rasulullah is a person who was taught and enabled by the spiritual power of the prophet to see god we all know the value of going to school of learning from a teacher whatever we want to learn you want to learn mathematics you want to learn medicine you want to learn how to cook that yes you can learn on your own but when you have a teacher it it empowers the process and something from the teacher comes to you and this the same thing in the area of spiritual knowledge and spiritual attainment and since the time of the prophet this program of spiritual companionship and dhikrullah was the method by which countless millions of muslims followed the path of the prophet because they imbibed the com- these companions imbibed from the prophet his his uh, his spiritual transmission that transformed him or her and therefore brothers and sisters you are therefore also advised and urged to find a spiritual teacher who can introduce you to this transformative powers of dhikr and by holding fast and seriously to their companionship by bringing a, by being a companion or a murid or a student of such a teacher that you imbibe from them such a spiritual transmission <laughs>
as I've frequently said, this is how Islam spread throughout its history. It was not spread by the sword and by war, as many people claim. In fact, after the destruction of Abbasid Caliphate in 1453, it was these spiritual teachers who expanded uh, the Committee of Islam into India, into Africa, into Central and Far East Asia. Why? By the power of Dhikrullah and the Sohbah. I care for brothers and sisters, I urge you to take seriously and personally the difference between doing Islam and being a Muslim. And we urge you to actively recite your remembrance of God, feel its effects in your soul, because Dhikrullah is more than just nourishment for your soul. Allah repeatedly commands us to remind him, فَسَبِّحْ بَرْحَمْنَ رَبِّكَ سَبِّحْ اسْمَ رَبِّكَ الْأَعْلَى Repeat tasbih, the names of your glorified Lord. يَا الَّذِينَ آمُنُوا أُذْكُرُ اللَّهَ ذِكْرًا كَثِيرًا Or you have believed, remember Allah frequently. وَسَبِّحُوهُ بُكْرَةً وَأَصِيلًا أَنُوا تَسْبِحْ to Him, glorify Him, Him, His praises, mornings and evenings. هُوَ الَّذِي يُصَلِّ عَلَيْكُمْ Allah is the one who does salah upon you. يُخْرِجَكُمْ مِنَ الظُّلُمَاتِ إِلَى النُّورِ to take you out of darkness into light. And he is ever merciful and compassionate towards the believers. Salam. The, their greeting, the greeting between the believers and Allah on the day that they shall meet him. Salam. Peace. And that feeling of peace is when you meet God. But even before you meet God in the hereafter, the dhikr will give you a foretaste of this peace, brothers and sisters. That's why I highly recommended. Allah has prepared for them a very generous reward. Brothers and sisters, may we be among those who, are, who greet Allah by this greeting of peace, who have this foretaste of a taste of peace before, while we're still alive in this world, and that we are among those whom Allah has prepared for us a very generous reward. Brothers and sisters, pray to Allah that He may answer our prayers. Allah Ta'ala, Yasajibli wa lakum. الحمد لله الحمد لله حمدا كثيرا كما أمر ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له المتعالى على المشاركة والمشاكلة لسائر البشر ونشهد أن سيدنا ونبينا محمدا صلى الله عليه وسلم عبده ورسوله النبي المعتبر وعلم أن الله تعالى صلى على نبيه قديمة فقال تعالى ولم يزل قائلا عليما وآمرا حكيما تنبيها لكم وتعليما وتشريفا لقدرنا به وتعظيما إن الله ملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد كما صليت على سيدنا إبراهيم وعلى آل سيدنا إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حامد مجيد I always recite this in Arabic. I will recite, we don't have, I don't want to spend the time reciting the whole part again in English, but I will, I want to recite this few verses or this first opening lines of this khutbah. Alhamdulillah, hamdan kathira. I mean, we praise God, we thank God with a frequent gratitude, frequently, Thanking him frequently. 
and we bear witness that there is no God but Allah Wahdahu alone لا شريك له he has no partner المتعالي عن المشاركة ومشاكلة لسائر البشر who is way exalted beyond any partnership or any resemblance to human beings ونشهد أن سيدنا ونبينا محمدا صلى الله عليه وسلم عبده ورسوله النبي المعتبر and we bear witness that our master and our prophet Muhammad may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him is his perfect servant or really slave Abd means slave means his bondsman owned by, by Allah and his messenger the recognized prophet and know that Allah the exalted has done salah upon the Prophet from before the beginning of time. It's because Allah the Exalted has said, and continues to tell us in the Quran, in other words, he's telling us not for us once, but it is it echoes continuously. His commandment, a wise commandment, as a to draw your attention to it and to remind you of it and for your information and knowledge and and um, and to uh, to to amplify the uh, the the status of the prophet here to, to honor and to amplify the nobility and the magnitude of the Prophet. He said, is, Allah says, Indeed, Allah and His angels have done salah upon the Prophet. Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu, O you who have believed, sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. Do salah upon him, and greet him often, or invoke peace upon him often. Now, when this verse was revealed, the companions of the Prophet didn't know how to respond to it. So he asked the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, how do we do salah upon you? You just say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. So let's read, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad, kama salli ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim, so we, but we do salah upon the Prophet by asking Allah to do his salah upon the Prophet. That's how we do salah upon the Prophet. As we, 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 we delegate the task, so to speak, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because we don't have the capacity. All we can is just plead for it. But by doing this, as we will discuss in a later time, this is how, because the Prophet has said, whenever we do salah upon him once, Allah will do salah upon us ten times. Now, I, I say this because we, we are urged to say this salat al rasul and to also to invite you uh, to uh, an event that we're doing a week from next Thursday, on the 29th of October, from 8 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. to honor the Prophet's birthday on that day, the 12th of Rabi'u al-Awwal, by having an event when when uh, Professor Muqtad al-Khan, whom you heard a couple of weeks ago, he delivered the khutbah, Dr. Asmi Sadiq will recite some poetry about the, about the Prophet, and I will talk about the Prophet and his importance and symbolism to us uh, from various points of view that we may have, particularly, of course, and most emphatically, the spiritual dimension of it. So I invite you all to, uh, to please register for that event on October 29th. اللهم اغفر للمسلمين والمسلمات المؤمنين والمؤمنات الأحياء منهم والأموات إنك سميع قريب مجيب الدعوات يا رب العالمين اللهم أيد الإسلام وأعلي وانصر كلمة الحق والإيمان اللهم اجعل خير زماننا آخرة وخير أعمالنا خواتيمها وخير أيامنا يوم لقائك وارفع مقتك وغضبك عنا اللهم ارفع مقتك وغضبك عنا 
اللهم ارفع نقتك وغضبك عنا لا تسلط علينا بذنوبنا من لا يخافك ولا يرحمنا يا رب العالمين اللهم أصلح أحوالنا وبلغنا مما يرضيك آمالنا واختم بالصالحات أعمالنا وبالسعادة آجالنا وتوفنا وأنت راض عنا يا رب العالمين نسأل الله العظيم رب العرش الكريم أن يغفر لي, أن يغفر لي ولكم والمسلمين أجمعين عباد الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذا القربة وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعظكم لعلكم تذكرون فاذكر الله العظيم يذكركم ونعم من أقدوء قيم الصلاة